The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Monday the 20th, 30 to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe? Well, stocks sliding sharply, bonds catching a bit, Evergrande, the Fed, fiscal uncertainty. Europe's taking it pretty hard on big volume when it comes to equities on the downside. Uh, the US is looking to lift travel restrictions on fully vaccinated EU and UK travellers. We're going to get the details. We're going to be joined by Air France KLM CEO Ben Smith. And UK energy companies will receive state aid as small arrivals fail due to soaring gas prices, which are up sharply again today. We're going to look at the impact that the shortages are having on the food industry. Let's talk about markets now. Let's figure out what's going on. There you go. There's the gas price up by another 15 percent today. Uh, in terms of equities, we're down by one to two percent, depending on your market. The DAX, which has expanded today, uh, is down the hardest. The China connection. Well, if you look at Europe and the way that it's breaking down today, Europe feels a bit more exposed to the China story. You wonder whether, that whether therefore, actually the kind of the gravitational effects is actually coming out of China today rather than the United States, despite the fact that a lot of people, Alex, are focusing on the Fed. Yeah, also, though, we did see a decline within U.S. equities on Friday, not in Europe. And in some ways, we, Asia picked that up, and now that has spread. So it's the disappearing by the dip. It, we closed below the 50-day moving average on Friday for the S&P. We're now looking at the 100-day. That's at 43.28. So we are still far away from that. However, we are picking up a little bit of steam here right around the lows of the session. The Nasdaq 100, large-cap tech, those growthy names, getting hit quite hard, down by another uh, two percentage points. Uh, Nomura uh, came out with a note that said you could see about a $40 billion in, uh, in um, force deleveraging by volatility-linked funds as volatility shoots higher, about 25 uh, there on the VIX. Money coming into the bond market, four basis points. It seems somewhat calm considering the sell-off that we are seeing in the equity market and the volatility. Nevertheless, a solid, solid bid in the back end of the market. All commodities getting hit with the exception of gold, a slight bid there, which is impressive considering the dollar is also rallying, but crude off by a solid one four percentage points. Uh, we have a lot of the metals and materials here in the U.S., one of the worst performers within the S&P guy. As I said at the top of the last hour, gold's worth keeping an eye on. When you start seeing gold turning, that's maybe when the fear starts really kicking in. Uh, commodities more broadly, though, Alex, as you say, taking a hit, iron ore extending its slump sub 100 china stepping up restrictions on industrial activity plus you've got the evergrande story which kind of feeds you in to what is happening uh, on the on the construction side let's talk about all of this is this the kind of the center of what is going on here bloomberg's eddie van der Volt on set with me to try and answer that question what do you make of the price action what comes next yeah, sure. I mean, look, we've, we, there's, there's obviously very different drivers in the commodities at the moment. On the one hand, we've got iron ore, as you say, very, very weak at the moment. And that's on this idea that China wants to cut back on its steel production, which de limits demand for iron ore. On the other hand, you've got uh, natural gas doing really, really well on the back of energy prices pushing higher. So it's two very different stories here. And, you know, I think for right now, the commodities markets, in order to navigate those streams, you've got to really have your wits about you. Yeah, definitely. And that really echoes into the equity market. Also, uh, Bloomberg's Eddie Vanderval will be joining us on radio as well in the next hour. So stay with us for that. OK, so let's get deeper into European equities. I want to bring in Noor Al-Ali of Bloomberg's uh, Markets Live. So we saw the commodity set up. Walk us through the destruction that we've seen in the equity market. Well, absolutely. As you said earlier, and piggybacking on the commodities section from Eddie, there's a lot of narratives here that markets, the equity markets are looking at today and thinking, oh, my God, it's time to sell. Why? Well, first, you've got Evergrande and that exposure there. And you've seen it today when you look at the Euro stock 600. And if you look at the AVAT function, it actually gives you the average volume at a given hour. And if you see in the last 128 days, we've got around 40 percent of that volume coming in today and even double that in the last 30 days. And the reason being really is the exposure here through insurance and banking to the property market in China. And of course, you've got the Fed coming up as well. Yeah, and that is a key, key subject for the rest of the week. Will what we're seeing in the markets right now and around the world change the narrative for the Fed? Bloomberg's uh, Ali, Ali, thank you very much indeed. Excuse me. Uh, another key event this week, central bank decisions.
The big one, of course, is the Fed. We've got the Bank of England as well. In fact, there's a whole raft of central banks 13. on deck this 13. week. 13. Yeah, which may be unlucky. We'll wait and see. Fair Reed point. Lamberg, Blue, Bloomberg's UK economy team leader, joining us now. The Fed, the Bank of England, we're watching very carefully what's going to happen. Do you think they are putting half an eye on what is happening with the markets, the, the story around Evergrande? Do you think this is going to in any way influence thinking? I, this feels like a, a relatively recent occurrence, but nevertheless, these, these, kind of, these challenges have been bubbling up for a while. I don't know about Evergrande, but I think certainly the markets are something they'll be looking at. The, the uh, yield curve in the UK has steepened quite a bit since their August meeting, about 20 basis points across the curve. And, you know, the bank has a very difficult balancing act. We have inflation rising in the UK, but you also have higher COVID numbers. You also have the furlough coming to an end, concerns about unemployment spiking. So the bank has got to balance all that in its decision on Thursday. Uh, Reid, do, uh, do all the central banks, are they in charge of this week right now, or are we looking at other forces that the central bank can't control? Well, at the, time, at the moment, the, the market rise in interest rates has been pretty gentle in the UK. So I think, you know, the consensus is that the Bank of England has time to wait and let its current asset purchase program unfold as they're planning 895 billion pounds of purchases by the end of this year. Okay. Well, it's going to be a big week. We're certainly going to look forward to some fantastic coverage. Um, as we've been saying, it is a huge week. Uh, we've got a whole raft of central banks coming through. Alex, uh, as you say, 13. We'll wait and see exactly whether any of this is going to change the narrative in the markets. The Fed and the Bank of England, obviously the two ones that we're going to be watching so carefully. Alex. Yep, we also have some politics that are changing uh, next weekend. Germany heading to the polls Sunday. Here with the latest Bloomberg's and Maria Tadeo in Berlin. Serious crunch time here. Where are we, Maria? Yes, you know, we have a week uh, to go. We had the third and final debate happening yesterday on TV. It was Olaf Scholz, the Social Democratic candidate, that won that debate, so that makes it three out of three. But what really caught my eye in this debate is the possible coalitions. He made it clear that his favorite partner would be the Greens. The head of the Greens also made it clear that her favorite partner would be the Social Democrats. And if you put all of this together, it means that Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats could be out of government for the first time in 16 years. Yeah, and that is a huge, huge shift, not only for Germany, but potentially for the whole of Europe. Maria, thank you very much indeed. Maria Tadeo uh, joining us from Berlin as we count down to the German election at the end of this week. What are we going to do next? We're going to dig more into these markets. Barnabas Wager, UBS's chief strategist, joining us next. This is Bloomberg. The market has been uh, uh, overlooking, I think, the potential impact on copper. I mean, the, the Evergrande situation, the concerns around China property uh, and the, the production of new homes in China, I think could be a risk to copper. And at the moment, copper has kind of flatlined for the last three months and, and are choosing to ignore some of the concerns at the moment, which they think are very steel and therefore iron ore specific. But I think there is a risk there of some contagion. Alan Custis from Lazard. Speaking to Alex and I on Friday, Alex, he raises the issue of Evergrande and draws the line from Evergrande to the copper market. The problem with Evergrande is that we don't know how messy it could get. Mm -hmm. We don't know all of the connections. And I think this is where life is going to get very interesting here. There's been a lot of uh, borrowing in the shadow sector. We don't know ultimately who holds the risk there. Yeah. So Evergrande still feels to me like a little bit of a black box. And, and I, Alan was drawing the connection to copper. Yeah. There's other fi within the financial sector and the asset management. I, we just don't know well, yet what the implications are. I think I was, was it Eric Nelson, I was reading a note over the weekend. I was talking about how um, Evergrande is definitely a deflationary impulse in China. Then the flip side, you have these record high power prices all over the world. You have high LNG prices. That's inflationary. And kind of when they go yep. more green, that becomes more inflationary. So these two opposing forces at the same time that then China has to manage. Yeah, and the, the energy story I think is interesting because it could be deflationary. It certainly could, it could hit growth quite hard, or I that. think, yes. uh, if consumers aren't protected. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges that authorities have got to deal with. The UK is trying to manage that process as we speak. Uh, and it's going to, again, 
drilling the dots. It ripples through the food sector. It, I, the, the, the implications, hard to manage and hard to understand. Barnab Oasia, UBS's chief strategist, joining us now on the line. Barney, let's start with Evergrande. How messy could this get? Um, I don't think this is a, a Lehman moment. Um, I think, look, when you try to reintroduce moral hazard after four major credit cycles, it, it is going to be messy. The biggest risk out here is not what happens to the suppliers or what happens to the financial system in the near term. I don't think that's an issue. I think China has managed that reasonably well. The default levels um, are pretty low in the overall economy and the capital adequacy for banks, particularly the large banks, is quite high. I think the most important issue is what this does to the collateral of the entire credit boom, which is property prices and therefore mm -hmm. confidence in property itself. Um, people have tremendous faith in Chinese policymakers' ability to try and put a floor under the property price uh, and therefore to prop it up. Uh, I think as they try now to emphasize the redistribution of, of the pie as opposed to just the size of the pie, there is a risk that in the next five years, uh, the CAGR of property prices is going to be very low, potentially even close mm -hmm. to zero. A and that comes with uh, not just a slowdown in Chinese growth, but much larger implications, as your previous guest was saying, for things like commodities. So I, I certainly oh. don't think this is uh, a credit crisis yet, but this Bonnie. is going to be a major slowdown in growth here. Yeah. Banu, does the market then have it right in how it's interpreting it, if it's going to front run that a little bit? You know, uh, different markets are saying different things. What's really interesting is that if you look at the credit market, uh, especially in the high yield space, of course, there is a reasonable amount of panic out there, uh, not so much in the IG space. But then if you look at the FX, uh, it doesn't want to know, right? Dollar CNY forwards, dollar CNY fall, they would remain extremely well behaved, right? And what's happening in the property market, what's happening in the equity market is not independent of, but precedes what's happening to Evergrande, right? China is tightening both on regulatory fronts and credit fronts, and that's why Chinese economy and Chinese asset markets are going to be under pressure. So I think the market that's most correctly priced here is probably the credit market, and the market I think that's least correctly priced is FX. So in terms of risk-reward, uh, this would be a time where we should be considering hedging downside in the RMB uh, for the medium term. Just more broadly, you started off this conversation saying something quite interesting. We are reintroducing moral hazard. Oh, whatever, you, you said a lot of interesting things about it, but that's what really <laughs> stood out to me. Um, thought I'd just cover myself there. Uh, <laughs> you, you talked about reintroducing moral hazard. Is that what's going to happen here? Because we've got a Fed meeting coming up later on this week. We've got other central banks, 13, Alex tells me, meeting this week. Are they prepared at this stage, given the fact that we've just come out of a pandemic, Given the fact that we are dealing with other issues, are they prepared at this point, do you think, to reintroduce moral hazard? I mean, from, from the perspective of, uh, if I hear you correctly, if you're thinking about taper and talking about um, higher rates, I, I think the Fed already drew that line in Jackson Hole when they said we are moving towards taper, and I think that's what we will hear this week as well. But they will emphasize that we are not going to move towards um, yeah. worrying about rate hikes anytime soon. I, I don't think that they will say that. Their dots will, Bonnie. however, just hi. What, what, I, what I'm interested in finding out is, is up until now, there has been this perception within the markets that they will be supported and protected by the monetary authorities. Does that still exist? If, we, if this correction gathers pace on the downside, how far is the, preferred, is the Fed prepared to go yeah. before it feels it needs to take action? The strike of the Fed's put is quite close. So the minute the Fed remains extremely focused on financial conditions. It has been since Alan Greenspan and then only become uh, more focused on financial conditions. So if you see credit spreads growing up, if you see S&P down 15, 20 percent, maybe even less, I think the Fed will step right in. So that put does exist. That's a completely different uh, matter to saying that you're going to see continued liquidity help. Given where real interest rates are, given where credit spreads are, you're not going to see incremental liquidity help. So the ability of liquidity to swell valuations, I think, is done. 
Uh, we are probably at a global uh, minimum for real interest rates. We're probably at a global minimum for credit spreads. When I say global, I mean over 20 years, we are at a minimum on both real interest rates, risk-free rate, and credit spreads, risk premium. So the ability of liquidity to inflate valuations from here is very limited. Now, if you were to see significant downside, I think the Fed will step right in and uh, basically uh, mm -hmm. limit the downside through financial conditions tightening by adding more liquidity. But between now and the next 12 months, I don't think we will see valuation-driven gains. We will see a much slower market of earnings-driven gains. Um, and, and typically, the gains in the market in, in that sort of a situation are 75 to 80 percent slower yeah. than in a valuation-driven market. So, Banu, it, from an SP perspective, it seemed like a lot of investors were at adequately hedged, so they can take this kind of sell-off. It feels like where the risk is is with negative earnings revisions and whether or not you're looking at, you know, tough comps, you're looking at uh, rising uh, wages, you're looking at labor costs, you're looking at uh, energy inputs, you're looking at a whole host of things. That seems to be the nut. When do you think we might start seeing that? So that's a crucial question, right? Now, if you look at the last 20 years, uh, how long has it taken for us to go from peak earnings momentum to zero earnings momentum? And, and the answer is somewhere between four to six months. Peak earnings momentum was uh, seen in May, and that suggests that around November, you could be moving towards earnings momentum that's close to zero in, if it were an ordinary cycle. Now, given that this is not an ordinary cycle, and you're coming from a much higher level of growth, PMIs, earnings momentum, this could last till the middle of Q1. That that's the time I think we really need to worry about because you could be seeing both real interest rates moving up and earnings momentum coming down. So I think that's the time, November onwards, late Q1, that's going to be a challenging time for the market. It's going to be fun. All right, Bani Babuja of UBS, uh, thanks very much. We love getting you on to chat. All right, coming up, uh, we'll follow that story about shortages, burgers, lamb chops. They could all get more expensive in the U.K. soon, and partly that's due to carbon dioxide. We're going to break that down next, and it's all because of those high energy power prices. Nick Allen, British Meat Processors Association CEO, joins us next. This is Bloomberg. There is absolutely no question, Mr. Speaker, of the lights going out or people being unable to heat their homes. There'll be no three-day working weeks or a throwback to the 1970s. Such thinking, Mr. Speaker, is alarmist, unhelpful and completely misguided. UK Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng addressing Parliament a little bit earlier on today. Um, RBC is estimating that consumers, though, could see their energy, energy bills jumping as much as £400 a year. The lights may stay on, but plenty of things are already changing as a result of the high gas prices that we're seeing, specifically the food industry. So, so let me just sort of draw a line here. Fertiliser uses gas as an input, the fertiliser industry, um, to create ammonia. And one of the byproducts of that is CO2. CO2 is used in the meat industry, as a result of which we don't have enough CO2 for the meat industry to function properly, and as a result of which we may end up seeing significantly less meat on the shelves and farmers having to keep livestock for significantly longer. Nick Allen is the CEO of the British Meat Processors Association. Nick, I, I talk to farmers, friends of mine are farmers, they're already struggling to get livestock to the abattoirs because of the HGV crisis. Talk to me yeah. about the impact that this is going to have. OK, so uh, you quite rightly said that this is about the CO2 shortage, which is a, a, a result of this fertiliser factory closing sort of down. Um, so we use CO2 in two areas, really. One is for the humane slaughter of animals, particularly pigs and sort of poultry, or well, specifically pigs and poultry. And we also use it to actually extend the shelf life of meat in modified atmosphere packaging. Uh, and without it, and certainly the concern at the moment is that 80% um, of our pigs and poultry in this country uh, get slaughtered using CO2. And actually, if we lose CO2, then we won't be able to operate. And the consequences will be that those animals will end up staying on farm. It's almost unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And then, as you quite okay. rightly say, these, these farmers are already having a problem because of labour shortages. There's already a bit of a back a backlog of pigs on the farm. Hey Nick, um, if CO2 is so critical to the food supply industry, 
why isn't it sort of bought differently or is the output not secured in the same way as if you were like a big industrial company buying your power? Uh, well, all, all, the, all our companies and all our members would have arrangements with suppliers and they'd, they'd have contracts with them uh, to actually, you know, su supply the CO2. But then when this plant or two plants closed without any warning whatsoever uh, because of the higher gas prices and, um, uh, you know, they just sort of said, well, that's it. it's no longer economical to produce fertilizer, it left everyone high and dry. Uh, so no matter what arrangements you've got and sort of said, you know, sort of right, you know, we're expecting deliveries. Uh, if they if, if it's not there, they just don't sort of come really. And it's almost um, uh, companies, supplying companies almost claim force majeure. It's not their fault. Uh, and the, uh, the the company needing the product is left holding the uh, uh, holding the baby, as it were. Is there any alternative to CO2? How much inventory is there within the system already? Uh, that we don't know. I, we probably uh, we, our members are telling us they can probably get by between sort of anything from five to five days to fifteen days uh, supply that they've got. They don't know what's going to be sort of coming and what's going to be delivered, uh, and uh, that that's their suppliers can't tell them. Um, uh, the poultry side is in a bit worse predicament. They're talking about sort of two days to eight days uh, in terms of supply that they've got. You know, uh, in terms of alternatives, there's very few on the poultry side. Uh, there are th there are a few alternatives, and they can revert to um, uh, some other sort of methods, which are an awful lot slower. But on the pig side, there's hardly any opportunity at all to sort of change the uh, uh, change the way we do it. This is regarded yeah. as the most humane way of uh, slaughtering animals, and um, uh, that's what they've all committed to. So when do you go to the grocery store and I start seeing pictures of bare shelves of meat, worse than I already see now? In the worst case scenario, if the CO2 dries up and our members can't get CO2, about four or five days after that, uh, the shelves will be empty of British meat and, uh, you know, British pork and British poultry. Um, it's, it's that quick. It's a fresh meat supply chain. Uh, certainly pigs and poultry are turned around sort of very quickly. Beef is, a hang, uh, is, is matured for a bit longer, but um, and, and the beef, its problems are more around the modified food packaging. Um, but in terms of pigs and poultry, it'll uh, it'll come through. So we're sort of three three weeks away, possibly, from uh, having some real empty shells unless they can resolve. Nick, really useful, really insightful in terms of what comes next. The market's trying to figure out and understand whether or not this is going to be another factor we need to think about when it comes to inflation. Nick Allen, British Meat Processors Association CEO. Sir, thank you very much indeed. Um, coming up, travel stocks jumping today. The US looks like it's going to uh, relax uh, EU and UK restrictions, i.e. you can fly from here to there. You've got to be fully vaccinated. We, we're waiting to see exactly what the testing requirements look like. Is this going to kickstart business travel? on the North Atlantic. Ben Smith is the Air France KLM CEO. He will be joining us shortly. As you can see, stocks moving higher. Looking forward to that conversation with Ben. He should be able to answer some of these questions. This is Bloomberg. OK, we're close to the close here in Europe. It was an ugly session from the get-go this morning. The legacy out of Asia, not particularly good. The Evergrande story front and centre. This is the picture we have right now. A sea of red across Europe. The selling has been delivered on high volume. That is worth paying attention to. Uh, the market fairly mixed. For instance, the FTSE 100 only down by 8 tenths of 1%. The DAX off by 2.3%. The DAX more exposed to the China story. We've also had, obviously, the expansion of the DAX over the weekend. That came into force first thing this morning at 10 additional stocks. The CAC Caron's down by 1.73%. The IBEX down in Spain down by 1%. So there is a bit of variation. Uh, the industrials are taking it pretty hard today. Uh, we are seeing the mining stocks as well under pressure. That's a drag on the London market. Let's show you how the session looks like. What I should have actually done here was shown you a two-day jip. Factor in Friday, which was actually OK. Uh, and then you get the big gap lower first thing this morning. The gap's here. It came down pretty sharply. And to be honest, we've actually been trading in a fairly tight range since then. So an early gap and then a fairly tight trading range. No evidence at this point of a significant dip buying 
kind of mentality coming back into the market. Those that have tried to buy the dip, and remember, that's the, remember, that's the muscle memory, have so far suffered for it. Uh, let's take a look at how we are breaking down the sector story because this is useful and instructive uh, in terms of where we're seeing the real pain coming through. As you can see, there are areas that are looking okay. Healthcare trading up by two tenths of 1%. That doesn't feel like a big move, but in a market that's down as much as it is today, that's pretty good. And that's what help, helps out London a little bit today. Down at the bottom, banks are down pretty hard. The insurance sector is down. Basic resources are down. That's the mining sector. The car sector is down pretty hard as well. But it's interesting. European banks really smoked from the get-go first thing this morning. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the shape of the curve changes that. But at the moment, that is not the narrative. Let's talk about some names. Luxury, exposed to China. Feeling the pain first thing, LVMH, the biggest points drag, uh, I think, on the Kakarant when I checked earlier on, down by 1.32%. But the selling has been ongoing and brutal in that area. The miners are down and down pretty hard. You can see Anglo. I could have picked a number of names today. Glencore, Rio, picked Anglo, down by 4.8%. But then we get to some glimmers of good news. I'm not sure whether you can draw a link between the submarine story and the fact that we have seen an announcement today by the United States that it is going to ease travel restrictions for travellers coming out of the EU into the United States, out of the UK into the United States. But that is the news that we are getting. The response from the travel sector on both sides of the Atlantic, particularly those stocks that are very exposed to the North Atlantic, which in the past has been hugely profitable, swift and clear. Stocks rising like IAG, uh, American over in the United States, and Air France, KLM, Alex, up by 5.46%. All right, let's stay on that story. Uh, joining us now is Air France KLM CEO uh, Ben Smith. Ben, a sincere pleasure. If this corridor is reopened to vaccinated individuals, how many more people fly on your planes? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me uh, so quickly after the announcement. I mean, it is great news for us. 40% uh, of our capacity and our revenues uh, are, well, 2019, we're destined to and from the, uh, the U.S. So it's fantastic news for our group, Air France KLM. And based on what we saw this summer, once the European, uh, inter-European borders open, we expect a return uh, of traffic numbers from 2019 to, uh, to move forward as close to, to those dates very quickly. So. You know, we're really, really uh, happy about this. We've been waiting a long time. It's been a year and a half. Ben, good afternoon. It's Guy in London. Um, how are you going to configure the aircraft? Are you going to be seeing this as a economy heavy to start with, i.e. that's the back of the plane you're going to be focusing on? Do you think this kickstarts business travel? What kind of mix do you anticipate seeing? I think it's both. I think uh, what we've seen so far in areas where restrictions have been lifted is uh, this pent-up demand both on the leisure side and the corporate side. And many businesses have not seen their colleagues, have not seen their customers uh, for you know, a year and a half. So definitely in the short run, we expect there to be uh, you know, a kickstart. Will that continue? Still to be seen. But for families uh, who haven't seen each other in a year and a half, it's great news. So we expect that uh, to, uh, to return quickly. And as I said, uh, pent-up demand for business, and we'll see if that holds uh, after uh, the initial uh, demand gets, uh, gets uh, realized. How much competition do you think there's going to be? Do you think there's going to be a price war on the North Atlantic as a result of this? There's a lot of capacity that could potentially come back on. Uh, look, there'll be some, uh, some pricing pressure. Uh, what we experienced this summer intra Europe uh, was uh, we've had worse. Uh, We've had much worse pricing, uh, worse than that. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've just got this news now. We're studying it. Uh, we're seeing how we can add capacity back. Uh, obviously, we'll be studying uh, what our competitors are very quickly. And we'll, uh, we'll be loading uh, new flights into the system probably as early as, uh, as tomorrow. Uh, so early as tomorrow, there, that's, that, that's pretty soon. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering when the travel catalyst will be. Because if we put aside business travel for a second, I don't know what that's going to look like. The summer season's over. No one travels that much in the fall to get the kids. Are you looking at the Christmas season then being that big boost? But if you're putting capacity in tomorrow, that implies more like a business travel kind of boost. Well, since the beginning of this crisis, uh, our booking curves have really changed. Uh, many of our customers, both leisure and business, have been booking much closer into their departure dates because of all the unknowns. Uh, when I mean we're going to load flights and capacity tomorrow, that doesn't mean flights for tomorrow. It means over the next uh, 365 days, we may adjust 
uh, that capacity getting in closer, but we will add capacity for sale uh, starting tomorrow. So you'll see, uh, you know, you'll see changes on our big uh, network routes or uh, you know some big volume routes uh, affected tomorrow. So we'll see what other carriers are doing. They'll see what we're doing because these will be publicly available uh, for sale. And as I said, 40% of our capacity uh, revenue was uh, was to and from the U.S. So we, you know, we had in 2019. Uh, up to 64 daily flights, Air France and KLM across the Atlantic, uh, into and from the U.S. Uh, what we've seen to and from Canada, uh, who uh, opened up their borders over the last, like in different phases over the last six weeks, is, it's been very positive. We've seen the return to very strong leisure uh, demand come back and some business uh, traffic come back. So hopefully, what we see, uh, what we'll see on the U.S. side, will be similar. Um, ben, how quickly can you bring back the long-haul fleet? Are you going to face any restrictions in terms of crewing? Are you going to face any restrictions in terms of aircraft, uh, slots, anything else? Is there anything that can stop you at this point? Are all your pilots current in terms of getting them back into the cockpit? Uh, well, this is a nice problem to have. We haven't had too many of those in the last year and a half. Uh, we have our entire fleet is... Uh, is serviceable. Uh, we've been flying our airplanes at much lower utilization rates, so we can up those rates whenever we want. From a crewing perspective, the unemployment scheme programs in Europe are very different than those in the United States or in Canada. So we have many employees that can be uh, recalled or can be uh, can up their uh, the the hours that they work quite quickly. So I don't think we'll have a shortage or issue. Uh, from a crewing perspective uh, over the uh, short or medium term. It's not something that, uh, that we're predicting. In terms of the destinations you're going to be flying to, uh, just to come back to this mix of, of leisure versus business, where do you think you'll be focusing on? Will you be focusing on key destinations? Are you going to start with New York? Are you going to start with other destinations? Or do you just basically go back to the original network model and, and just basically kind of start flying to, to most of the key destinations? Uh, well, we've, we've maintained service uh, throughout this crisis to most of the destinations in North America, which we were flying to prior to the beginning of the crisis, uh, thanks to the uh, very strong cargo uh, demand. So that has uh, helped us maintain, uh, maintain uh, frequencies and, and destinations. So we will increase the number of frequencies. Uh, obviously, and we expect the uh, the load factors on board to be much higher. Uh, example, you know, in Los Angeles, we would have up to up to five flights from uh, our hubs into LA, and that was reduced down to one or two uh, during the crisis. So, how quickly we can get back up to the same level of frequency, we're going to study that quite quickly, and we'll see. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll put in some uh, uh, some changes into that uh, into that plan as quickly as we can. So, as I said, we already have the majority of the network online. Uh, it's just the number of frequencies. Some of them, they were flying daily. We reduced it down to a couple of days a week. Some of the, in some of the situations, we were flying larger aircraft uh, before, and now we're flying smaller airplanes. And since the beginning of this pandemic, we've pulled out our large, our largest planes. The Airbus A380 at uh, Air France is now out. Uh, our Boeing 747s at KLM have also been retired. So the average size uh, gauge of airplanes that we have has, uh, has come down. Ben, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very much indeed for jumping on so quickly after the news broke. Very nice to speak with you. Ben Smith, the Air France KLM CEO. Uh, we're also getting more news from the North Atlantic, uh, uh, the other side of the North Atlantic. I guess it depends on where you're watching from, from my point of view, the other side <laughs> of the North Atlantic. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, the uh, AUKUS pact, the submarine pact, which the French are so up in arms about, or not, um, doesn't have to be uh, exclusionary or divisive. The, the, him talking about sort of excluding, I think, is quite interesting because the idea has been that it does essentially exclude France. He's saying it doesn't have to be divisive. There's definitely an effort, and I wonder whether this, this reopening of travel routes is part of this to try and de-escalate uh, the, uh, the, the, the challenge that this has posed, particularly when it comes to relations with France. Anyway, what have we got coming up for you next? Uh, this morning, I had the opportunity to sit down with the UAE's economy minister. Uh, we'll hear some of that conversation next. This is Bloomberg.
because in some, some parts of the supply chain, nationally into, into the countries, and so, so, so therefore to reduce that kind of prices. This is Bloomberg Markets, the European close. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Bob Moritz, the PwC chairman. That's at 2 p.m. in New York, 7 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. So the pandemic changed the economy of the United Arab Emirates really quite significantly. Uh, the country is now trying to get back on the front foot, um, looking to sign deals with 10 countries around the world, basically looking to deepen economic ties. It's targeting 4% economic growth this year. We'll see whether or not labor and material shortages, like so many other economies, end up crimping growth. Abdullah bin Tuk Almari is the country's economy minister. Uh, he arrived in London yesterday. I had the opportunity to sit down with him and chat first thing this morning. Take a listen to our conversation. The uh, uh, pre-COVID economy is not going to be the UAE post-COVID economy. It's just that the UAE, I think the globe is yep. looking at the same kind of thinking as well. And I think it's important to really assess the kind of economy that we want for the next 10 years. So we put a plan, a 10 by 10 plan, which we looked at, the 10 countries we're looking at. But these are the first batches. We're going to have more batches coming in. And we look at the future technologies such as agri-tech, edu-tech, uh, AI. We're looking at uh, healthcare as well into it. There's a lot of the new, you know, when COVID-19 comes in, healthcare is really vital and important for the human. You know, how do you balance between human and economy at the same time? So there's a lot of human uh, and health uh, technology that we would like to attract. So there's a lot of this coming into the economy the next 10 years. So this is a 10 by 10 focus for the next 10. But actually, it's more than 10. It's more 16 kind of uh, uh, sectors, but right. most focusedly on the 10, which is really into the industry uh, for the future economy. How are those investments going to be made? Can you give us some specifics there? So we're looking at uh, uh, more into uh, uh, trade uh, investments. We're looking into uh, attracting businesses into it. Uh, we have uh, we're sovereign wealth funds who are actually active in this areas in this business, uh, especially in, the, in, in green and renewables and, and a lot of that kind of technology which we push as well. Uh, we heard a lot of news uh, this last week with his uh, uh, Royal Highness visit uh, last week, uh, and I think the announcement of uh, the 10 billion pound uh, uh, fund, uh, a, a million pound up now for, for life sciences. I think that's something which is really important to bring that kind of aspect in the future of economy and investment into it. Okay, let me, let me just ask you about what comes next. So you've talked about the, six, the 16 on the sector side. Can you tell me what the other six are? And you talk about a sort of the next batch of 10 in terms of the investment targets, the countries you're looking at. Does that list exist already? Who's on yes. it? Where are you going to be going? Yeah, with the that list exists, was announced last two weeks' time. And I think we're looking at, as well, more investment into the traditional sectors like, you know, the tourism, uh, aviation sector, logistics as well is a big part of that. So that's part of the 16 kind of a wider list. Yep. But yes, we, we do look at the future list and the, and the current list as well. We're trying to, 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 to track a balance in between the, the investments and where we're looking at. The 10 countries at the moment has been announced and the UK is, is, is a major part of that as well. We're looking at more, adding more batches in the next uh, years. Let's talk a little bit about where, where the economy is right now. As we've already discussed, coming out of COVID, um, the Everywhere around the world is trying to figure out what the post-COVID world yeah. looks like. You've recently upgraded your expectations quite significantly in terms of what kind of GDP growth you're going to be seeing. One of the challenges that so many economies around the world are sort of having to deal with right now are labor shortages, uh, skill shortages, material shortages. And all of these things are potentially going to slow the rate of growth down. Yeah. Are you seeing that in the UAE? What can you do about it? I think that's, uh, that's a major challenge at the moment. You, know, you, you see the prices of container ships went, went from $2,000 to $50,000 a shipment. And that shows as well there is a huge uh, 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 lag of, of, of demand that came in from due of COVID-19 situation where there was a lot of lockdowns happened. There was a lot of slowdown to, to the production and supply chain. Today, in 2021, there's, everyone is back. Lockdown is much uneasy. And I think it's more of now an incline going forward. But what we saw is as well, 
these kind of uh, domains has two, two kind of pillars. One is on a, on a medium term, I think, uh, looking at how do you reduce that price by changing, for instance, uh, uh, airlines from seaters to cargoes, for instance. And we saw that in the major national uh, airliners, uh, moving yep. a lot of seats out and putting a lot of cargo, cargo planes and, and reducing and trying to reduce that. But on the longer term, I think governments around the world need to look at the aspect of uh, prioritizing some, some parts of the supply chain nationally into, into the countries, and so, so, the, so therefore to reduce that kind of prices of inflation on, on, on the longer term. But this is a, a, a I think it's a, it's a very important to discuss it on the multilateralism level with the WTO, really to rediscuss the kind of the whole supply chain of, uh, of trade globally. Uh, what's going to happen? Government's really thinking about the long term. If this is going to be temporarily, that's fine. But if it's going to be very permanent, then we need to really, really What do you think it. it's going to be? Do you think it's going to be temporary or do you think it's going to be permanent? I think, uh, I think temporarily. I think this is more temporary basis. Uh, let's hope it's temporary. The UAE's economy minister speaking to me a little earlier on today, Abdullah bin Tuk Amari. Alex? All right, well, uh, coming up, we're going to talk more about the markets, how to trade this right now. You're looking at S&P around the lows of the session, 1.8% uh, on the downside. Utilities trying to eke out a gain here on that safe haven bid, but all the cyclical guys, consumer discretionary, financials, energy getting hit, volatility picks up, bid into the bond market, your traditional risk off. What do you do? This is Bloomberg. Ugly, ugly day evolving here in the U.S. market. Uh, I'm Alex Steele, New York. Guy Johnson over in London. This is the European close on Bloomberg Markets. How do you play today? What do you do? Uh, Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers, a chief strategist, joins us now. Steve, uh, we're seeing the declines pick up. We're a new low for the session. Now we're 1.9 percent off in the S&P. Now you can make the argument that traders were pretty well hedged uh, into today. So what's the real damage? Um, good morning, Alex. As of now, not much. We really haven't broken the longer-term uptrends. Yes, we broke the 50-day, but the, we haven't broken the 100-day, which is about 43, 43.25, give or take. Um, we haven't really broken that. We see the 50-day still pointing higher. We see the 100-day pointing higher. Uh, we still, even at these levels, are just flirting with 5% off, off the highs reached just over two weeks ago, mind you. Um, so we are not exactly in a, in a terrible situation. Yes, today is not a pretty day. I think it's largely because we're not used to days like today, um, rather, than, rather than this being a true game changer, at least so far. If that's the case, when do I buy the dip? Well, I would... <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I think people. I think some. I think what you're seeing today is some people who have been conditioned to buy the dip. You know, the, every dip, um, getting a little bit stung today. Um, and that's going to hurt. I think that's why we're seeing some of the sell-off, and I think why we saw some of what I would consider some stop-loss selling when we broke 50. I think the first place I would look would be about 43.28 or so, 43.25. That's the 100-day moving average. <clears throat> we we haven't really even tested that mm. since March, and and even the, before that December. Um, and we, you know, the, those haven't come under test yet. So that would be my logical place to look, at least uh, at least in the short term. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that we haven't tested that uh, since March. Um, okay, a question for you here. Uh, Nomura was saying that there could be some forced deleveraging uh, by volatility-linked funds, anywhere from $15 billion to $40 billion. We always see these kind of articles when you see sort of the knock-on effects of certain types of quant funds uh, that are, that are going to get hit. Have you done any modeling? Do you have any idea of that set, uh, today? I don't have the I don't have the numbers that that they have access to. Um, what you know, it, it's not a coincidence that this is happening on the Monday after a, after a quarterly expiration. The last move down that we had of this magnitude was actually right after July's expiration, and the prior move before that of any magnitude was on uh, June's quarterly expiration, and that was erased immediately on Monday. So the, this is definitely a normal piece of the you know grinding of the gears that you see after options expire. Um, and so whether or not the, I don't have a magnitude of how much the volatility funds would be impacted. Right now, what we're seeing is VIX is, you know, up about four points on the short end, five points on the short end, but 
that is not sufficient to really get us into that level of backwardation that we see when we really have that panic about, vault, you know, we need vault protection and we'll pay any price for it. Um, right now, we're not there. And that's telling me that you're not seeing the type of force deleveraging or the type of force, you know, that get me out trade yep. or get me protection trade that we've been looking for. Mm. Steve, great stuff. Thanks for jumping in. Great to get the insight. Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist, joining us there as these markets. We'll see what, what the end of the day looks like. Alex, it's, this, this was Monday. It's, and the rest of the week is absolutely rammed. How many central banks was it? 13. 13. Okay. I mean, to gonna, be fair... It's going to be a busy week. Six major ones, seven emerging market ones, but still, 13 is a lot. It is, and six major ones. That's probably enough to be going on with. So what else we got? Next 24 hours, President Biden meeting with the UN Secretary, Secretary General. That's happening tonight in New York, if I can speak. Canadian elections, obviously, <laughs> uh, to watch as well. Uh, the UN General Assembly debate get, begins tomorrow. What else we got? Yeah, we got FedEx. We got the OECD publishing their economic outlook. A lot going on. Plus, wall-to-wall -wall traffic because of UNGA here in uh, New York City. That wraps it up for me and Guy. Come, coming up, Balance of Power with David Weston. This is Bloomberg.